memory of Pogrom by the survivor of Auschwitz. We get to get to next lecture. With that, I'd like to um, ask our President Alex to introduce us again. Professor Steiner is widely regarded as one of the greatest minds in today's literary world. He has published essays, books, literature critiques, and some of his fam most famous works include Tostoy Dostoevsky, The Death of Tragedy, and After Babel. He is an extraordinary fellow at the Churchill College at Cambridge, a position which he has held since 1969. Professor Steiner has also taught at the University of Geneva. He was Lord Weidenfeld Professor of Comparative Literature in Oxford, um, he was also Norton Professor of Poetry in Harvard, and he's honorary fellow at numerous colleges at Oxford, Cambridge, as well as in other places around the world. Um, Professor Steiner holds a degree in Literature, Mathematics, and Physics from the University of Chicago, and a May degree from Harvard, a PhD from Oxford, which he attended as a Rhodes Scholar, and he has won various awards and prizes, and to summarize, to list them all, we would need another lecture. Mm -hmm. Um, Professor Steiner will be speaking to us tonight on the topic of whether it is possible to speak intelligently of the Holocaust. Thank you. Thank you. It is a privilege to be with you tonight. The radical Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben proposes the following argument. Anyone who speaks about the Shoah is a liar, I quote directly. Elie Wiesel, Robert and Primo Levi, who are the three most widely known witnesses, are simply lying, says Agamben. If you can speak about Auschwitz, you are lying. The only ones who can bear witness, I'm summarizing his argument, were those who were called Muslimener, the Muslimener, those who no longer accepted food or water from the liberating troops in Belsen, who refused to speak and who simply waited for death, the Muslim men. Agamben says that in the Imperial War Museum in London, there are a few photographs of the Muslim men. There's an immense, as you know, iconography of the corpses and of the newly liberated people in the camps. These of the Muslim men have never been published, have never been shown, and are not accessible. They're said to be beyond bearable horror. And this would make, this would give to Agamben's argument a particular edge. And I want to be very, very careful. The negationists is the French word, negationist, it began in France. Those who say there never was a Shoah, there never were death camps. The negationists are, when they are Jew haters and neo Nazis, simply obscene and insane. I refused always to debate with them because they are not, in my opinion, rational human beings. But now, let's be very, very careful. The negationists, since they began with Professor Florisson, have the following argument, and I quote, the organization, execution, and consequences of the alleged death camps are strictly inconceivable, sont inconcevable. And that's where things get very deep and very interesting. In what sense are they indeed inconceivable? Some powerful minds 
can conceptualize a hundred dead people, even that's difficult. Millions are entirely beyond the reach of the intelligible conceptual mind. When the negationist says, give me proof, there have been lawsuits, as you know, there have been ample demonstrations of survivors, but again, there is a worrying element to this. Proof alone is a very elusive, philosophically complicated business. An estimated 30 million Americans at the moment believe that Elvis Presley has risen from the dead. <laughs> the king lives, an estimated 30 million. All there are, not very far from the great centers of learning and thought which are in Manhattan, very close, there are people who tell you that a certain Mr. Schneerson is the Messiah and that he has risen. And it is no use saying no. It's absolutely no use. It is non-negotiable. The notion of proof is a very complex one. Particularly when it applies to phenomena beyond our rational understanding. We begin by asking tonight, what makes the Shoah different? And forgive me if I go slowly, because one gets it wrong. Whatever one tries to say, I will be getting it wrong. mass massacre, men, women, and children, please look at the book of Joshua. The Amalekites and the Hurites are to be massacred by the people of Israel, men, women, and children. And their cities are raised to the ground. And that's already very late in history. The prehistory of massacre is as long as man. Mass murder has been a constant feature of political and military history. Statistically, the Shoah is very small beer. Very small beer. Those done to death by deliberately organized starvation in the Ukraine in the campaign against the Kulaks, 21 to 27, 1921 to 27, are estimated at four and a quarter million. It's a rough estimate. That's just, that's just in the Ukraine. Responsible historians put at 18 million meaningless figures. I say them to you, but I can't understand them. 18 million, the victims of Stalin's deportations, Gulag, Kolyma, the camps, 18 million. But that's nothing. Mao Zedong's enforced famine, we only now have the documents, 40 million were done to death. 40 million. By that unspeakable, inconceivable criterion, the Shoah is indeed a rather minor horror. Even the death of Soviet war prisoners in German hands, or those who died of starvation in Leningrad, come very close to the destiny of the Jews at Nazi hands. Moreover, ethnic slaughter, slaughter based on ethnic criteria, seems to have persisted since the end of World War II in Indonesia, Cambodia, Ceylon, Rwanda, 
what is there to the claim that the Shoah is a singularity? I borrow the word from physics. A singularity, a horror sui generis, like no other. There have been many attempts at answers. I confess I find them problematic and difficult again to understand. It is said that no other example can be given of genocide, itself a modern word, a very slippery word, of genocide based wholly on ethnic identity. But that isn't true. The Turks and the Armenians in 1915 was explicitly based and only based on ethnic identity. What exactly is the difference between programming the slaughterhouse of Jews and, say, taking a whole people, the Tamils, or in Rwanda, the Tutsis and Hutus, and saying we will kill everyone who belongs to that ethnic group? One struggles with the problem Perhaps somewhere the Shoah is different in that it was meant to eliminate, to make totally impossible any biological continuation of a people, to kill as it were the unborn child. Tricky, possibly a metaphoric answer, but let's keep our minds open to the fact that it is a very difficult concept to define and whatever our feelings about it personally or in a group like tonight when someone says just what makes it so different we have to listen very closely and very carefully the incomprehensibility of the conception of the planning and execution from within the heartland of high civilization of universal literacy. As you well know, Goethe's garden <coughs> literally abuts, he walks through the garden of Weimar into the concentration camp. The great Debussy cycle piano by Giza King said to have been never rivaled in its tender wonder. Right next door to the concert hall ran the rails to Dachau and people dying of hunger and thirst in those sealed cars could be heard screaming. They were heard by some of the people in the concert hall. And Giza King played Debussy like that never before or after. Remember the promise of the Enlightenment. And the men I will quote were not naive, they were not pastoral fools, they were among the most powerful minds the West has ever produced. And I quote, Never again will civilized men burn a book, Thomas Jefferson. We have seen the end of torture among the peoples of Europe. Or there. The often unvoiced presumption was that the jungles of Africa were one thing, but Goethe's Buchenwald is another. How did this phenomena spring from within? the heartland of intellectual and moral magnificence, education, literacy, schooling, <coughs> art, music. How do we think of this correlation if we try to think of it at all? Yes, there were distant warning signals 
it's so easy to be wise after the event. I keep thinking that history changed on the day on which a very splendid, though not major, French poet and writer, Théophile Gautier, <coughs> exclaimed, rather barbarism than boredom. Plutôt la barbarie que l'ennui. An enormous boredom has grown up in high culture. An enormous kind of hunger for violence, perhaps, though that sounds melodramatic, a kind of feeling of being crushed by the high culture of the past, an envy for more primitive forms of emotional and political expression. But that's only a guess. The number of those who foresaw what was going to happen was minute, absolutely minute. It included the great anti-enlightenment thinker, the left of S, and I quote, the 20th century will see a sea of blood. 20e siècle verra mer de sang. De Mestre believed in original sin. And that small handful of major metaphysical thinkers who regarded history as a form of punishment, as vulnerable to the vengeance of God, did see what might come. Nietzsche said there will be wars such as men have never witnessed before. But they were very, very few. In the summer of 1913-14, you can count on one hand the thinkers, the artists, the writers, the politicians who saw the apocalypse just around the corner. It was a time of almost insolent happiness and of enormous cultural achievement. The history of what I call, it's an awkward word, forgive me, the ontological motif, it's a pompous way of saying that which tries to deal with the essence of being of a phenomenon. It's that of an identification of Judaism with pestilential evil. Even the unborn must be eliminated. But this focused insanity may have grown up first in the Middle Ages, during the time of the Crusades, then, of course, in the great horror of the Russian and Polish pogroms. But by the time Germany had become modern Germany, Nowhere had a simulation, for all its difficulties here, for all its social problems, for all its academic exclusions, a simulation had been a tremendous success. For this there's no, no parallel before that. <coughs> the notion that this country would transform the Shoah remains profoundly profoundly puzzling. Many have tried to identify as a peculiar and unique aspect the industrialization of the death camps. This was a line explored often very brilliantly by those whom we now call the Frankfurt School, by Adorno and Horkheimer and their sociological disciples. That the assembly line of the 19th century factory and what is called in America tailorization, the tremendous invention of exchangeable anonymous parts, had prepared for the possibility of Auschwitz. The factory in flourishing capitalism had begun to dehumanize the human body. I want to quote an extraordinary passage 
from Engels, Engels' great book on the condition of the English working class. He's watching people leaving a cotton mill. I suddenly realized that their faces had been wiped out. That there was no way of telling one human being from another. They had been reduced to helpless puppets. This is 1841. It is an extraordinary prophetic insight that the factory process prepares us for the anonymity of man. Add to this a brilliant guess. It's probably wrong. It doesn't matter. It's so immensely suggestive by the great social thinker and novelist Cadetti, Elias Cadetti, in his book Crowds and Power. Makes the following suggestion. During the Weimar inflation, your loaf of bread would cost 1,000 mark in the morning, 10,000 in the afternoon, a million by evening. The inflation in Weimar, Germany, destroyed the reality of numbers. People lost their grip on numbers. They became an absurd, empty nothingness. And that where this happens, a political community may be right, right for the anonymities and the mass slaughter of the Shoah. It's only a guess, but I think it's a very worrying and suggestive one. <clears throat> Indeed, where currency is destroyed, something central seems to be lost in human confidence. And there's no doubt that Hitler restored that confidence Hitler gave back to his enthusiastic followers a sense of their superiority and of their human dignity. This is no doubt. Did the inflation, did the mass production prepare the actual industrial character, the mechanistic character of the bureaucracy of the Nazi death camp? I'm not certain as to how crucial this was and whether it makes of the Shoah man's midnight and a legacy like no other. <coughs> to those who put forward this claim, there have been angry denials. Much has not been published but is now becoming accessible. The Jew hatred of that great, great fighter for human freedom, Solzhenitsyn, Solzhenitsyn was infuriated by the Jewish claim of exclusive suffering. He said that too was absolutely unjustified. They compared to Kolima, the Gulag, mass deportation and starvation under Stalin. No claim could be made for a Jewish singularity. All of which questions are now compounded with the creation and destiny of the State of Israel, which has become an immensely complicating factor in our attempts to understand the Shoah. With never again as its fundamental justification, we must be very careful again, it's not a very nice story. For a long time, Zionism and the Israeli government chose to ignore the Shoah completely. Neither would allow it to be studied nor discussed. There were complicated reasons for this. Psychologically, Ben-Gurion hated the very notion of Jews being helplessly slaughtered when he was founding an immensely confident, combative, proud new state. <clears throat> he did not at all go as far as Hannah Arendt in her analysis of the Juden councils and of Jewish passivity, but he came pretty close to it. 
and for a very long time <coughs> survivors led a marginal, almost leprous life in the new nation. Then it changed. Then it changed. Then Yad Vashem became possible. <coughs> then the great witnesses began to visit Israel and speak out eloquently. But to this day, the relations are complex. When the Palestinian says, we didn't do it, so why should we bear the cost? It is a very human protest. When, on the other hand, the example of the Shoah is cited as a model for possible further Islamic action, it becomes deeply disturbing. The United States, in its grand innocence, <laughs> four or five years ago, organized an exhibition of Shoah photographs and history to be shown in Delhi. The exhibition had to be closed after a few days. And many of the people came and said, ah, ah, that's how it's done. And this has never been foreseen. Those to whom this unspeakable horror was an example, a suggestion, a possible precedent. Today, as I say, Yad Vashem is on the necessary route for every visiting statesman, but I'm not altogether wrong, I believe, when I say the relationship continues to be a very problematic and a very uneasy one. At all points, the question of would Israel have come into being without the Shoah is still taboo. And it can be argued in many ways. It can be argued that American interests, even Russian interests, remember immediate recognition <coughs> by Stalin, complex geopolitical arguments, etc., etc. Excellent arguments can be made. But I find it difficult to exclude altogether the haunting thought that without that unspeakable horror, the state of Israel would not have come into being. As you know, the volume of secondary material is now virtually incommensurable. Hundreds of books hundreds of monographs, journals on historical, economic, sociological, psychological, even psychoanalytic aspects of the Shoah. No one can even hope to keep up with the rate of publication. There are studies of individual camps, detailed monographs on the different camps on different Nazi butchers, memoirs, novels, plays, poems, very recently a big opera, films, on a towering scale. There have been those who have derided it angrily as a veritable industry one of the unforgivable yet deeply witty sarcasms about Elie Wiesel, you know it all, six million characters in search of an author. This was quoted widely across the whole of Europe. A plethora of Holocaust studies and institutes flourishes in the United States. In communities, academic and otherwise, they have never had a Jewish link or only of the faintest. Programs of study, of publication, of teaching are flourishing. The greatest of Holocaust museums is in Washington. But there are innumerable local shrines. And God help us, there is what is called Holocaust tourism. Holocaust tourism. To my very generous host at dinner, 
I quoted when I came to Krakow some years ago. There's a lovely hotel where Barisak stayed. And as you enter, on the desk where you register, there's a sign, may we arrange your taxi to Auschwitz. I almost passed out, and I'm pretty good at not passing out. <laughs> and it wasn't meant in any ugly or hostile way. Not at all. It was meant to help the visiting tourists. May we arrange your taxi to Auschwitz. Auschwitz is right next to Krakow. A whole industry has grown up. And let us for once be fair. In no country is more done to take children to the camps then in Germany, school children are taken in large groups to see the camps for themselves. And whereas there are such nations unspeakable in their hatred of Jews, such as Austria, in Germany there has been a conscious and major educational effort, die Vergangenheit zu bewältigen, to master the past master the past. In this concatenation, what has brought us closer to the meaning, to the real issues of this bestiality, to the diminution of the threshold of rational man, of what it is to be human? There have been great historical insights some from Oxford, indeed. Oscar Browning's study of German military unit, of an ordinary everyday unit, turned into a killing machine. Ralph Hilberger's seminal study of the Shoah system. Saul Friedlander, <coughs> Sir Martin Gilbert, and so many others who've done tremendous work. There have been acts of witness, such as the Warsaw Ghetto Diaries of Ringroom, which are matchless, and the Diaries of Anne Frank. Have these brought the essential to light? Have they made conceivable the abolition of why? I'm referring to a specific moment in Primo Lake. A Jewish prisoner is dying of thirst. You may remember the moment. The Gestapo man pours out the glass of water onto the ground. With his last breath, the Jewish victim says, Warum? Why? And the Gestapo man answers, There is no why here. Here did this kind Warum. I don't want to exaggerate, nor in any way to palliate the bestiality of this moment, but it's an answer of deep metaphysical power. Here there is no why. Try to imagine for a moment a world without Lahu, without why. In my own very limited experience, there have been three authentic penetrations into the black hole. And each of you will have his own list. I don't for a moment urge this as canonic or exclusive. Once you've seen the Alt Neue Synagoge in Prague, which is kept intact by the Germans as it was going to be a museum of the degenerate. So it was kept intact. And the Jewish cemetery, the famous one with Rabbi Lerby's tomb, you move among these unbelievably beautiful stones. You remember the story that when the mobs the medieval mobs tried to desecrate it. They threw a dog over the wall, and Rabbi Le ordered that the dog receive a beautiful tomb, like in the cemetery. And as you go next door, you come to a small museum of the Holocaust. <coughs> and there is a room in which are the children's drawings Drawings made by the children in the camp of Theresienstadt. 
Now, Theresienstadt was their Potemkin village. It was their showpiece. It was meant to fool the idiots who visited from abroad. It was relatively bearable on the way to Auschwitz. <coughs> and the children were allowed a considerable measure of freedom. And they were given crayons and paper by the Nazis themselves. And the children drew the impressions of Theresienstadt and of their parents and of other children. I can't for a moment tell you how immensely important this document is. It is the unvarnished truth as, as no adult can entirely conceive of it the way children see death and see danger and see menace in these drawings, some of which are terribly joyous. Uh, from time to time, the butchers handed out chocolates. And there are drawings of this moment. But over each drawing hangs the shadow of imminent death, though the children might not have been able, certainly not to formulate it this way, and their parents tried to keep it from them, from their realization. But I would name these drawings as the first of my incorruptible documents. The second, which many of you may know, is Claude Lanzmann's film. Again, we have to go slowly here. Lanzmann is one of the most despotic, almost in his persona, almost a parody of a fascist. Lanzmann filmed 300 hours, 300 hours. Of these, nine have been shown also in London. The usual version is four or five hours, but there have been several showings of a nine-hour version selected by Lutz. You know that it's like nothing else that has ever been attempted by a camera. You know of the immense controversies it raised. Lutzmann, genius, is an act of genius, was simply to make of the rail lines and of the trains moving the constant statement of what was happening. There are scenes which have been criticized as totally unacceptable, in inadmissible. The scene of the man who cut the hair of the corpses when they were taken out of the oven and among them was that of his wife, and he speaks of this to Lanzmann. Lanzmann is off, off camera, but you hear his voice. There are those who said Lanzmann had no right to film much of Shoah. It is an immense feat, an immense act. To this day, no version of even nine hours or six hours, but only a few private cut versions have been allowed in Poland. I will not look at the film. It has been widely seen and studied in France and Germany. Lanzmann was Sartre's secretary, which gave him a unique entree into the French cultural world. The film leaves one totally numb, totally helpless, which it is meant to do, but also so far as a non-participant can even venture to say this, there are moments when you are there. I know of no other work that does this, like the children's drawings at Theresienstadt. The third of the titanic acts or documents which gives me my title tonight, is the poetry of Paul Celan. When I published the first 
English language notice on Ceylon, very politely, the TLS called me and said, are you sure of the spelling? No one had heard the name. Today, the Ceylon industry is again unsurveilled. He is, since Hölderlin, the greatest poet of the German language. There begin all our problems. His parents were killed in the camps, his mother and father. He began in Romanian. He had studied German, Russian, French before leaving Bukovina. And he wrote a poem called The Death Fugue. And here all the ironies begin. I drink the black milk of midnight Shulamit. It became the greatest school poem in Germany after World War II to Ceylon's horror. It became almost the chivalrous of learning by heart. Millions of Germans know that poem by heart. It's not his greatest poem by a long shot. But it poses the essential problem. How does a Jew write in the language of those who killed his mother and father? He could have written in Romanian. He's written wonderful French poems. His Russian allowed him to rival Mandelstam, who was his counterpart. He wrote in German, knowing that he was adding to the transcendent glory of German literature. <clears throat> Knowing that with every line, he was, as it were, denying the unspeakable identity of that language. It was to prove psychologically unendurable to him. I will not go into the details and not directly relevant. He committed suicide at a young age. But the central problem had been posed. A transcendent poet, the language of the butchers, of the killers of your parents. Wrote a number of poems directly related to the Shoah, almost all of but there are a number directed. One is called Psalm. It contains a movement which has also become famous in a hundred languages. Pray to us, God. Pray to us, God. Be it to uns, God. Not we to God, God to us. That's what the situation for a Jew now is. He must bid God pray to him after what happened. Engstrette, which is very difficult to translate, is to narrow passage, the oven passage, in which he takes up the Hitlerite insult, what are Jews, said Hitler? They're air creatures, Luftmensch. They have no ground on which to put their feet. Yes, says Selam, we are the ash wind, the ashen wind. <coughs> We are indeed all of us, Luft mentioned it with He's made of us the creatures of the air. And when thinking about whether a time might come when that German language, which he now shared with Hölderlin and Rilke, at the very summits of a great literature, could again be endured in truth. By Jew he found the immortal phrase, Ja, eines Tag, yes, one day, im Norden der Zukunft, to the north of the future. Im Norden der Zukunft. That there might one day be a moment when the German language would come home to the truth, which it has, according to Ceylon and many others, tried to avoid. Northern <clears throat> These three 
testimonials, the children of the Rietenstadt, Landsmann's Shoah, the poetry of Paul Ceylon, help me misunderstand. They help me feel helplessly in search. They keep me searching and looking and trying to understand. You will say that's no program. Indeed, it isn't. For how much longer many of you will have children break out soon? Will it still be a living presence? For how much longer will the Shoah? <coughs> very, very difficult question to answer. How much longer will school children be taken to Bergen Belsen? How much longer will Yad Vashem be visited? How much longer will the Washington Museum be the great center of the city? No one knows. There are those in Israel who will say to you, enough. We will die of remembrance unless we forget, forget in a creative sense, unless we get going with the confidence not only that it will never happen again, but that if we're attacked, we will defend ourselves, we will win, etc., etc. The whole rhetoric of survival, which you know. There are people, good Jews, who say to keep looking back at the Shoah is in a sense a blasphemy. It is a mysterium tremendum, as theology says. But if we bring up our children in Jewish life, in the Jewish world, that is the real answer. That is the true answer and the only problem. To these arguments, and with a very great sense of inadequacy among you tonight, I have nothing useful to publish, to add. I sometimes dream of a moratorium on discussions and books about them. I dream, suppose there was a papal act, ten years without these books. A moratorium. A moratorium on commentaries, on attempts to apply socio psychological, sociometric, biometric, traditional historical criteria to something that is entirely beyond them, though I don't quite know in what way. So I've come up with an extremely simple-minded suggestion, bear with me, that each and every one of us should learn by heart ten names from the great list. The lists are everywhere. They're on your Google, they're on the Internet, they're on your web. Ten names of ten victims, part of my own family, is among the 86,000 names in the front. Pick anywhere 10 names and once a week perhaps recite them. Making of this an internal yishko, a yishkadal Elohim of recall. God, it's a simple-minded suggestion, but I have nothing better to say. Thank you.